Hello and welcome back to Classics Book Classic Books with a star, Jamie, Lily, and Chloe. And as always, I want to remind you, stay safe and healthy. Hit that like button, subscribe, comment below, and hit the notification bell. And today we're going to get back to uh, John Steinbeck's Of Mice and Men. We are going to do the summary and analysis of Chapter 4 and then we get on to Chapter 5. And without further ado, let's get there. Summary and Analysis of Chapter 4 It is Saturday night and Crooks is alone in his room when Lenny appears in the door. At first, Crooks sends Lenny away, but eventually a conversation ensues in which Lenny says he came into the barn to see his pups, and Crooks warns Lenny that he is taking the pups from the nest too much. Lenny's disarming smile finally warms Crooks, and he lets Lenny stay and talk. During their conversation, Lenny reveals the secret about the farm, which Crooks initially thinks Lenny is making up. Crooks also prods Lenny about his relationship with George and scares Lenny by suggesting that George might not come back. The more Crooks presses Lenny, the more Lenny becomes scared and upset. As Lenny circles dangerously close to Crooks, Crooks realizes the danger he is in and gently calms Lenny down, explaining that George is not hurt and that he was just... Supposing Crooks then talks about his own loneliness. Candy appears and talks with Lenny about the rabbits. Crooks interrupts and says there are, they are kidding themselves about this farm because George is in town spending their money at a whorehouse. Expl exclaiming that the money is actually in the bank, Candy describes their farm where, no, where couldn't nobody throw him off of it. Crooks, Crooks asks to join their ventures and says that he would work very hard and for no pay. Curly's wife appears in the doorway claiming that she is looking for Curly and complaining that she just wants someone to talk to. Candy says accusingly that she has a husband and she should not be fooling around with other men. When Curly's wife protests that Curly doesn't spend time with her, hates everyone else and just talks about fighting, she suddenly remembers Curly's smashed hand and asks what happened to it. Candy tells her twice that Curly caught it in a machine, but she doesn't believe him. Lenny watches her, fascinated, and Crooks keeps very quiet. Finally, Candy tells her to go away because she is not wanted in the barn. She will not get, she will get them fired, he adds, and they don't need to hit the highway yet because they have other ideas like getting their own place. At this revelation, Curly's wife laughs at the men and says it will never happen. Before she leaves, she asks Lenny where he got the bruises on his face. Guiltily, Lenny, Lenny says, Curly got his hand caught in the machine, so I mean, because he didn't know how to respond. When she continues to talk to Lenny, Crooks tells her she has no right in his room and that he is going to tell the boss to keep her out. Curly's wife threatens Crooks with lynching because they were awful back then. Still can be now. When Candy threaten, when Candy says that he and Lenny would tell on her for framing crooks, she counters by saying no one will listen to the old swamper. The four then hear noise in the yard and realize the men are returning. Curly's wife tells Lenny she is glad he busted up Curly a bit and then she leaves. George appears and Candy admits that he told crooks about the farm. It is evident that George is not happy and so the, he, the defeated crooks tells Candy to forget his offer to help with the hoeing and doing odd jobs. Let's see the next step. The analysis. This chapter begins with a description of a place this time. It is Crook's room in the stable. Crooks, the black stable hand, lives by himself in the harness room, a shed attached to the barn. Injured when a horse kicked him, Crooks has, has a body that is bent to the left because of his crooked spine. The stable hand has many horse care items in his room, as well as personal belongings he keeps because he is more permanent tenant. Besides shoes, a clock, and a shotgun, Crooks also has a dictionary, a battered book of the California legal code, ma magazines, and a few porn books, and a pair of spectacles. <clears throat> Crooks' room is a source of pride, and he keeps it quite neat. Crooks' room is a masterpiece of understatement, and, it is very, and its very nature shows how Crooks is different from the other ranch hands. Much of the room is filled with 
boxes, bottled harnesses, leather tools, and other accoutrements of his job. But it is a room for one man alone, but scattered about on the floor are his personal possessions accumulated because unlike the other workers, he stays in this job. He has golden spectacles to read. Reading, after all, is a solitary experience. Well, not with us. <laughs> <clears throat> his pride and his self-respect are obvious from the neat, swept condition of his room, and his conversations are both the reality of accepting his solitary position and his anger at this condition. Candy while around, <clears throat> excuse me, while around the place all the time has never been in Crook's room. The stable hand is not allowed in the bunkhouse because he is black. <clears throat> Back in the days of uh, segregation when he has an opportunity to wield some power of his own and hurt someone else as he has been hurt, Crooks takes the opportunity by picking on Lenny. But then sensing Lenny's fear and power, he backs down. Through the description of Crooks' room, his past life, and his current existence on the ranch, Chapter 4 continues Steinbeck's themes of loneliness, barriers between people and the powerlessness of the little guy in a huge world. Crooks describes his solitary life in terms of all the workers. He shares with Curly's wife the problem of no one with whom to talk. When Lenny questions him about the pups, Crooks changes the subject and mentions, I've seen it over and over, a guy talking to another guy, and it don't make no difference. We don't hear or understand. The thing is, they're talking or they're setting still not talking. It's just being with another guy. That's all. Crooks can relate to the loneliness of the ranch hands. He goes back to his room and reads alone. Sure, you could play horseshoes till it got dark, but then you got to read books. Books ain't no good. A guy needs somebody to be near him. A guy goes nuts if he ain't got nobody. Don't make no difference who the guy is, long as he's with you. I tell you, guys, <clears throat> a guy gets too lonely and he gets sick. Crook's loneliness is part of Steinbeck's microcosm of the world. Multiply Crook's a million times in Steinbeck is pointing out the barriers and artificial obstacles people in society build against each other. And they still do. I mean, there are many examples out there. Adding the crook's sense of po powerlessness is his position, which is made clear by Curly's wife when she breaks up their little gathering. When Crooks tries to gather to get her to leave because her presence is sure to cause trouble, she tells him, I could get you strung up on a tree so easy it ain't even funny. No, it's not funny. Crooks knows that she is absolutely correct, especially back then. In fact, once she uses her position as Curly's white wife as a weapon, Crooks dissolves into nothingness. Steinbeck describes him growing smaller, pressing himself against the wall, and trying to avoid the hurt. As Steinbeck states, Crooks had retired into the terrible protective dignity of the Negro. Candy with his old age, Lenny with his retardation, Crooks with his race, Curly's wife with her gender, all are victims of the attitudes and prejudices of society. <clears throat> Crooks is not only as realist about his position in society, but he is also prophetic about George and Lenny's dream. Like the many other migrants he has seen come and go, Crooks tells Candy that he has never seen one realize their dream for land. The reason they do not get the land is stated clearly by Crooks and echoed by Curly's wife. Crooks explains, I've seen guys nearly crazy with loneliness for land, but every time a whorehouse or a blackjack came, took what it takes. This pronouncement is played out in wits and the rest of the hands' behavior on Saturday night. All have gone into town. They never see beyond the end of the week. Curly's wife reinforces this idea when she tells them, if you had two bits in the world, why you'd be get in getting two shots of corn with it and sucking the bottle of glass? I know you guys. I mean, people can change. I mean, there are people that can do it. It is always the dream of the powerless to have a little land where they can make their own decisions and be their own bosses. In this case, having their own place would ease the loneliness and put a damper on Candy's fear that he'll be turned out when he's too old to work. That is a fair possibility. Crook's fear, fear he'll be gone because of his race and bad back, and George and Lenny's desire to be free of the boss and do what their hearts desire. But Crook certainly tells the reality of the story in one of the most poignant speeches in the novel. Just like heaven, everybody wants a little piece of land. 
I read plenty of books out there. Nobody never gets to heaven and nobody gets no land. It's just in their head. They're all the time talking about it. But it's just in their head. There's the speech foreshadows George's plight at the end of the book. Now, I mean, this is kind of a downer. I don't, I, I think people really do try that. They can do what they would like to do in life. And that is the end of chap of uh, not chapter, but the end of um, summary and analysis to chapter four. We're going to get into chapter five. Alrighty, chapter five. One end of the great barn was piled high with new hay, and over the pile hung the four talon Jackson fork suspended from its pulley. The hay came down like a mountain slope to the other end of the barn, and there was a level place as yet unfulfilled of the new crop. At the sides, the feeding racks were visible, and between the slats, the heads of horses could be seen. It was Sunday afternoon, the resting horses nibbled the remaining wisps of hay, and they stamped their feet, and they bit the wood of the mangers and rattled their halt halter chains. The afternoon sun sliced in through the cracks of the barn walls and lay in bright lines on the hay. There was the buzz of flies in the air, the lazy afternoon humming. From outside came the clang of horseshoes on the playing peg and the shouts of men playing, encouraging, jeering. But in the barn it was quiet and humming and lazy and warm. Only Lenny was in the barn, and Lenny sat in the hay beside a packing case under a manger in the end of the barn that had not been filled with hay. Lenny sat in the hay and looked at a little dead puppy that lay in front of him. Oh, Lenny looked at it for a long time. Then he put out his huge hand and stroked it, stroked it clear from one end to the other. And Lenny said softly to the puppy, Why do you got to get killed? You ain't so little as mice. I didn't bounce you hard. He bent the puppy's head up and looked in its face and he said to it, Now maybe George ain't going to let me tend no pup rabbits if he finds out you got killed. He scooped a little hollow and laid the puppy in it and covered it over with hay out of sight, but he continued to stare at the mound he had made. He said, this ain't no bad thing like I got to go hide in the brush. Oh no, this ain't. I'll tell George I found it dead. He unburied the puppy and inspected it and he stroked it from ears to tail. He went on sorrowfully, but he'll know. George always knows. He'll say, you you done it. Don't try to put nothing over on me. And he'll say, it. say now just for that you don't get to tend no rabbit. Suddenly his anger arose. God damn you, he cried. Why you got to get killed? You ain't so little as mice. He picked up the puppy and pup and hurled it from him. He turned his back on it. He sat bent over his knees and he whispered, Now I won't get to tend the rabbits. Now he won't let me. He rocked himself back and forth in his sorrow. From outside came the clang of horseshoes on the iron stake and then a little chorus of cries. Lenny got up and brought the puppy back and laid it on the hay and sat down. He stroked the pup again. He wasn't big enough, he said. They told me and told me you wasn't. I didn't know you'd get killed so easy. He worked his fingers on the pup's limp ear. Maybe George won't care, he said. This here, goddamn little son of a bitch, wasn't nothing to George. <clears throat> Curly's wife came around the end of the last stall. She came very quietly so that Lenny didn't see her. She wore her bright cotton dress and in the mules with the red ostrich feathers. Her face was made up and the little sausage curls were all in place. She was quite near to him before Lenny looked up and saw her. In a panic, he shoveled hay over the puppy with his fingers. He looked sullenly up at her. She said, What you got there, sonny boy? Lenny glared at her. George says I ain't to have nothing to do with you, talk to you or nothing. She laughed. George gives you orders about everything. Lenny looked down at the hay. Says, I can't tend no rabbits if I talk to you or anything. She says quietly, he's scared Curly will get mad. Well, Curly got his arm in a sling, and if Curly got, gets tough, you can break his other hand. You didn't put nothing over on me about getting it caught in no machine. But Lenny was not to be drawn. No, sir, I ain't gonna talk to you or nothing. She knelt in the hay beside him. But listen, she said, all the guys got a horseshoe tenement going on. It's only about four o'clock. None of them guys is going to leave that tenement. Why can't I talk to you? I never get to talk to nobody. I get awful lonely. Lenny said, well, I ain't supposed to talk to you or nothing. I get lonely, she said. You, <clears throat> you can talk to people, but I can't talk to nobody but Curly. Elsie gets mad. How'd you like not to talk to anybody? Lenny said, well, I ain't supposed to. George scared I'll get in trouble. <clears throat> she changed the subject. 
what you got covered up there, covered up there. Then all of one of these woes came back, and I'm just my pup. I said sadly, just my little pup. And he swept the hay from on top of it. Why, he's dead, she cried. He was so little, said Lenny. I was just playing with him, and he made like he's going to bite me, and I made like I was going to smack him, and, and I'd done it, and then he was dead. She consoled him. Don't worry. Don't you worry, none. He was just a mutt. She's not a very nice person. You can get another one easy. The whole country is full of mutts. <clears throat> the pop can get a whack. It ain't that so much, Lenny exclaimed miserably. George ain't gonna let me tend no rabbits now. Why don't he? Well, he said if I done any more bad things, he ain't gonna let me tend the rabbits. She moved closer to him and she spoke soothingly. Don't you worry about talking to me. Listen to the guys yell out there. They got four dollars bet in that tenement. None of them ain't gonna leave till it's over. If George sees me talking to you, he'll give me the hell. Give me hell, Lenny said cautiously. He'll, he told me so. Her face grew angry. What? What's the matter with me? She cried. Ain't I got a right to talk to nobody? What do they think I am anyways? You're a nice guy. I don't know why I can't talk to you. I ain't done no harm to you. Well, George says, you'll get us in a mess. Aw, nuts, she said. What kind of harm am I doing to you? Seems like they ain't none of them cares how I live, gotta live. I tell you, I used to living like this. I ain't used to living like this. I could have made something of myself, said Darkly. Maybe I will yet. And then her words tumbled out in a passion of communication, as though she hurried before her listener could be taken away. I lived right in Salinas, she said. Come there when I was a kid. Well, a show came come through, and I met one of the actors. He said I could go with that show, but my old lady wouldn't let me. She says, because I was only 15, but the guy says I could have. If I'd went, I wouldn't be living like this, you bet. Lenny stroked the pup back and forth. We're going to have a little place in Rabbits, he explained. She went on with her story quickly before she should be interrupted. Neither time I met a guy, another time I met a guy, and he was in pictures. Went out to the Riverside Dance Palace with him. He says he was going to put me in the movie. He says I was a natural. As soon as he got back to Hollywood, he was going to write to me about it. She looked closely at Lenny to see whether she was impressing him. I never got that letter, she said. I always thought my old lady stole it. Well, I wasn't going to stay no place where I couldn't get nowhere or make something of myself. And where they... Stole your letters. I asked her if she stole it too, and she says no. So I married Curly. Met him out to the Riverside Dance Palace that same night, she demanded. You listening? Me, sure. Well, I ain't told this to nobody before. Maybe I oughtn't to. I don't like Curly. He ain't a nice fellow, and because she had confided in him, she moved closer to Lenny and sat beside him. Could have been in the movies and had nice clothes, all of them nice, clothes like they wear, and I could have sat in them big hotels and had pictures took of me. When they had them previews, I could have went to them and spoke in the radio, radio and it would have caught, wouldn't have cost me a cent because I was in the picture, in all of them nice clothes like they wear, because this guy says I was a natural. She looked up at Lenny, and she made a small, grand gesture with her arms and <clears throat> hand to show that she could act. The fingers trailed after her leading wrist, and her little fingers stuck out grandly from the rest. Lenny sighed deeply. From outside came the clang of a horseshoe on metal and then a chorus of cheers. Somebody made a ringer, said Curly's wife. Now the, lighter was, now the light was lifting as the sun went down and the sun streaks climbed up the wall and fell over the feeding racks and over the heads of the horses. Lenny said, maybe if I took this pup out and throwed him away, George would never know, and then I would tend the rabbits without no trouble. Curly's wife said angrily, Don't you think of nothing but rabbits? We're going to have a little place, Lenny explained patiently. Now, what I'm getting from this is about desperation. I mean, it probably is a little bit harder, especially back then, for a woman to have, and for the, the black guy to have back then. But I think, you know, well, part, I mean, my opinion Thoughts are, if you really, 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 really try, and you save, 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 yes, you can do something, but 
then some people are in situations where they are crushed under poverty and under desperation and I mean it's just like today's societies so people are just so desperate and there's just many many people out there and now with COVID-19 and everything it's it's hurt a lot of people you know besides you know just not just the sickness part of it obviously a lot of people died but not just that part um, but the businesses have, have suffered because they had to have the quarantine. I mean, they had to have the quarantine, don't get me wrong, because it would have been worse, but it's still, I mean, every, a lot of, a lot of people suffered, you know, people committed suicide over, and then there's the post-COVID, which a lot of people don't understand post-COVID, which I can, that, that just correlating it with today, you know, I mean, a lot of people just and what like, angers me because I've had COVID and I've got post-COVID and it's been pretty bad and people don't seem to understand, you know, it's not just either you, or, how is it, you get it and you die, but it can be like symptoms as well. I mean, I've, I've had ongoing symptoms and so much pain from it and they, they think that, oh, well, we should be okay. And it's not like that. I mean, you know, unless you've had it, as you know, I mean, my fiance, he's he's had problems, you know, with neurological problems. Some pretty scary neurological problems. And, and me, mine's been gastro. I mean, it's just the pain has been incredible. Couldn't sleep, fatigued, oh you name it, I mean and and it and it and then you get other symptoms that come along with it and I just don't like people like throwing in their two cents when they don't know. Let me get back and get off my, my uh, cause I, and I do know, so I'm not, I'm not speaking from something I don't know. Okay. We're going to have a little place, Lenny explained patiently. We're going to have a house and garden, a place for alfalfa and that alfalfa is for the gardens and I take a sack and get it all full of alfalfa and I take it to the rabbits. Oh, and another thing I want to mention, they were dealing with the depression back then, too, so it was harder to save anything, so they, that would have, so things were a lot different back then. Then he had to think carefully before he could come to a conclusion. He moved cautiously close to her until he was right against her. I like to pet nice things. Once at a fair, I seen some of those, them long-haired rabbits, and they was nice, you bet. Sometimes I've even pet mice, but none when I could get nothing better. Curly's wife moved away from, from him a little. I think you're nuts, she said. No, I ain't, Lenny explained earnestly. George says I ain't. ain't. I like to not pet nice things with my fingers, soft things. She was a little reassured. Well, who don't, she said. Everybody likes that. I like to feel silk and velvet. Do you like to feel velvet? Lenny chuckled with pleasure. You bet by God, he cried. Happily, and I have some, had some too. A lady give me some, and that lady was my own Aunt Clara. She give it right to me, both that big, this big a piece. I wished I had this velvet right now. A frown came over his face. I lost it, he said. I ain't seen it for a long time. Curly's wife laughed at him. You're a nut, she said. But you're a kind of nice fellow, just like a big baby. But a person can see kind of what you mean. When I'm doing my hair sometimes, I just set and stroke it because it's so soft. To show how she did it, she ran her fingers over the top of her head. Some people get got kind of coarse hair, she said complacently. Take curly. His hair is just like wire, but mine is soft and fine. Of course, I brush it a lot. That makes it fine. Here, feel right here. She took Lenny's hand and put it on her head. Feel right around there and see how soft it is. Lenny's big hand, fingers fell to stroking her hair. Don't you muss it up, she said. And he said, oh, that's nice. And he stroked tired. Oh, that's nice. Look out. Now you'll muss it. And then she cried angrily. You stop it now. You'll mess it all up. She jerked her head sideways. And Lenny's fingers closed on her hair and hung on. Let go, she cried. You let go. Lenny was in a panic. His face was contorted. She screamed. Then Lenny's other hand closed over her mouth and said, please don't, he begged. Oh, please don't do that. George will be mad. She struggled. Violently under his hands, her feet battered on the hay, and she writhed to be free. And from under Lenny's hand came a muffled screaming. Lenny began to cry with fright. Oh, please don't do none of that, he begged. George 
Gonna say I done a bad thing. He ain't gonna let me send no rabbit. He moved his hand a little, and her hoarse cry came out. Then Lenny grew angry. Now don't, he said. I don't want you to yell. You're gonna get me in trouble, just like George says you will. Now don't you do that. And she continued to struggle, and her eyes were wild with terror. He shook, shook her then, and he was angry with her. Don't you go yelling, he said, and he, sh and he shook her, and her body flopped like a fish. <laughs> And then she was still, for Lenny had broken her neck. Ooh. He looked down at her and carefully he removed his hand from her mouth and he, she lay still. I don't want to hurt you, he said, but George will be mad if you yell. And she didn't answer nor move, but he bent closely over her. He lifted her arm and let it drop. For a moment he seemed bewildered, and then he whispered in a fright. I done a bad thing, I done another bad thing. And unfortunately, back then they didn't have uh, they didn't have uh, kind of homes they have, you know, where they're taking care of people with special needs. He pawed up the hay until it partly covered her. From outside the barn came a cry of men and the double clang of shoes on metal. For the first time, Lenny became conscious of the outside. He crouched down in the hay and listened. Done a real bad thing. He said, "I should have shouldn't have done that." George will be mad, and he says, and hide in the brush till he come. He's going to be mad in the brush till he come. That's what he said. Lenny went back and looked at the dead girl. The puppy lay close to her. Lenny picked it up. I'll throw him away, he said. It's bad enough like it is. He put the pup under his coat, and he crept to the barn wall and peered out between the cracks toward the horseshoe game, and then he crept around the end of the last manger and disappeared. The sun streaks were high in the wall by now, and the light was growing soft in the barn. Curly's wife lay on her back. She was half covered with hay. It was very quiet in the barn. The quiet of the afternoon was on the ranch. Even the clang of the pitched shoes, even the voices of the men in the game seemed to grow more quiet. The air in the barn was dusky, in advance of the outside day, a pigeon flew in through the open hay, hay door and circled and flew out again. Around the last stall came a shepherd bitch, lean and long, with heavy hanging dugs. Halfway to the packing box where the puppies were, she caught the dead scent of Curly's wife, and the hair rose along her spine. She whimpered and cringed to the packing box and jumped in among the puppies. Curly's wife lay with a half covering of yellow hair, hay, and the meanness and the plantings and the discontent and the ache for attention were all gone from her face. She was very pretty and simple, and her face was sweet and young. Now her rouged cheeks and her reddened lips made her seem alive and sleeping very lightly. The curl's tiny, tiny little sausages were spread on the hay behind her head, and her lips were parted, as happened sometimes. A moment settled and covered and remained for much more than a moment, and sound much stopped, and movement stopped for much, much more than a mom moment. Then gradually time awakened again and moved sluggishly on the arm. Um, the horses stamped on the other side of the feeding racks, and the halter chains linked, clinked. Outside, the men's voices became louder and clearer. From around the end of the last stall, old Candy's voice came. Lenny, he called. Oh, Lenny, you in here? I've been figuring some more. Tell you what we can do, Lenny. Old Candy appeared around the end of the last stall. Oh, Lenny, he called. Again, and then he stopped, and his body stiffened. He rubbed his smooth wrist on his white stubble whiskers. I didn't know you was here, so he said to Curly's wife. When he didn't answer, he stepped nearer. You, oughta, you oughtn't to sleep out here, he said disapprovingly. And then he was beside her and said, and oh, Jesus Christ, he looked about helpless and he rubbed his beard and he jumped up and went quickly out of the barn. Okay. But the barn was alive now. The horses stamped and snorted and they chewed the straw of their bedding and they clasped the chains of their halters. In a moment, Candy came back and George was with him. George says, what was it you wanted to see me about? Candy pointed at Curly's wife. George st stared. What's the matter with her, he said. He stepped down and then he echoed Candy's words. Oh, Jesus Christ. He was drawn down on his knees beside her. He put his hand over her heart and finally when he stood up slowly and stiffly, his face was as hard and tight as wood and his eyes were hard. 
Candy said, what done it? George looked coldly at him. Ain't you got any idea? He asked, and Candy was silent. I should have knew, George said hopelessly. I guess maybe you, my back, way back in my head, I did. Candy asked, what are we going to do now, George? What are we going to do now? George was a long time in answering. Guess we got to tell the guys. I guess we got to get them and lock him up. We can't let him get away while the poor bastard starved and he tried to reassure himself. Maybe they'll lock him up and be nice to him. But Candy said excitedly, we ought to have a different world back then. They weren't so nice. Not that they're nice now, but... But Candy said excitedly, we ought to let him get away. You ought, you don't know that, Curly. Curly would get gone to want to get him lynched. Curly will get him killed. George watched Candy's lips. Yeah, he said at last. That's right, Curly will. And the other guys will. And he looked and he looked back at Curly's wife. Huh. Now Candy spoke his greatest fear. You ain't and me can get that little place, can't we, George? You you and me can go there and live nice, can't we, George? Can't we? Before George answered, Candy dropped his head and looked down at the hay he knew. George said softly, I think I knowed from the very first. I think I knowed we'd never do her. He used to like to hear about it so much, I got to thinking maybe we would. Then it, it's all off, Candy asked sulkily. George didn't answer his question. George says, I'll work for a month, my month, and I'll take my 50 bucks, and I'll stay all night in some lousy cat house, or I'll sit in some pool room till evening goes home. And then I'll come back and work another month and I'll have fi 50 bucks more. Candy said, he's such a nice fellow. I didn't think he'd do nothing like this. George still stared at Curly's wife. Lenny never done it in meanness, he said. All the time he'd done bad things, but he never done them out of mean. He straightened up and looked back at Candy. Now listen, we got to tell the guys. They got to bring him in, I guess. They ain't no way out. Maybe they won't hurt him. He said sharply, I ain't going to let him hurt Lenny. Back then they would. Now you listen. The guys might think I was in on it. I'm going to go in the bunkhouse. Then in a minute you come out and tell the guys about her. And I'll come along and make like i never seen her. Will you do that so the guys won't think I was in on it? Candy said, sure, George. Sure, I'll do that. Okay, give me a couple of minutes then. And you come running out and tell like you just found her. I'm going now. George turned and went quickly out the barn. Old Candy watched him go. He looked helplessly back at Curly's wife, and gradually his sorrow and his anger grew into words. Goddamn tramp, he said viciously, you've done it, didn't you? I suppose you were glad. Everybody knowed you'd mess things up. You wasn't no good. You ain't no good now, you lousy tart. He snibbled, and his voice shook. I could have hoed in the garden and washed dishes for them guys. He paused and then went on in the sing-song, and he repeated the old words. If they was a circus or a baseball game, we would have went to her. Just said to hell with work and went to her. Never asked nobody say so. And they'd have been a pig and a chickens and in the winter, the little far sto fat stove and the rain coming. And us just sitting there, his eyes blinded with tears, and he turned and went weakly out of the barn and he rubbed his bristly whiskers with his wrist stump. Outside, the noise of the game stopped. There was a rise of voices in question, a drum of running feet, and the men burst into the barn, Slim and Carlson and Young, Wit and Curly, and Crooks keeping back out of attention range. Candy came after them, and last of all came George. George had put on his blue denim coat and buttoned it, and his black hair hat was pulled down low over his eyes. The men raced around the last stall. Their eyes found Curly's wife in the gloom. They stopped and stood still and looked, and Slim went quietly over to her, and he felt her wrist. One lean finger touched her cheek, and then his hand went under her slightly twisted neck, and his fingers explored her neck. When he stood up, the men crowded near, and the spell was broken. Curly came to life. I know who's, who done it, he cried. That big son of a bitch done it. I know he done it. Why, everybody else was out there playing horseshoes. He worked himself into a fury. I'm going to get him. I'm going to. I'm going for my shotgun. I'll kill the big son of a bitch myself. I'll shoot him in the guts. Come on, you guys. He ran furiously out of the barn. Carlson said, I'll get my Luger, and he ran out too. Slim turned quietly to George. I guess Lenny done it all right, he said. His, her next bus, Lenny could have did that. George didn't answer, but he nodded slowly. His hat was so far down on his forehead, his eyes were 
covered. Slim went on, maybe like that time in weed you was telling about. Again, George nodded. Slim sighed. Well, I guess you, we, we got to get get him. Where you think he might have went? It seemed to, to take George some time to free his words. He would have went south, he said. We come from north, so he would have went south. I guess we got to get him, Slim repeated. George stepped close. Could it, couldn't we maybe bring him in? Then lock, they'll lock him up. He's nuts, Slim. He's never done this to be mean. He never done this to be mean. Slim nodded. We might, he said. If we could keep Curly in, we might, but Curly's going to want to shoot him. Curly's still mad about his hand. And suppose they lock him up and strap him down and put him in a cage. That ain't no good, George. I know, said George. I know. Carlson came running in. The bastard stole my Luger. He shouted. It ain't in my bag, Curly followed him, and Curly carried a shotgun in his good hand. Curly was cold now. All right, you guys, he said. The Negro's got a shotgun. You take it, Carlson. When you see him, don't give him no chance. Shoot for his guts. That'll double him over. Ooh. Don't I know it. Wit said excitedly, I ain't got no gun. I ain't got a gun. Curly said, you got, you go and solo that and you get a cop. Get Al Wiltz. He's deputy sheriff. Let's go get him. He turned suspiciously on George. You are coming with us, fella. Yeah, said George. I'll come. But listen, Curly. The poor bastard's nuts. Don't shoot him. He didn't know what he was doing. Don't shoot him, Curly said. Cry. He's got Carlson's Luger. Of course we'll shoot him. George said uh, weakly. Maybe Carlson lost his gun. I seen it this morning, said Carlson. No, it's been took. Slim took, stood looking down at Curly's wife. He said, Curly, maybe you better stay here with your wife. Curly's face red, and I'm going, he said. I'm going to shoot the guts out of that big bastard myself. Even if I only got one hand, I'm going to get him. Slim turned to Candy. You stay here with her then. Candy, the rest of us better get going. They moved away. George stopped the moment beside Candy, and they both looked down at the dead girl until Curly called. You, George, you stick it with us, you stick with us so we don't think you had nothing to do with this. George moved slowly after them. And his feet dragged heavily. heavily. And when they were gone, Candy squatted down in the hay and watched the face of Curly's wife. Poor bastard, he said softly. The sound of the men grew fainter. The barn was darkening gradually, and in their stalls, the horses shifted their feet and rattled the halter chains. Old Candy lay down in the hay and covered his eyes with his arm. It's the end of chapter five. Chapter six is going to be pretty short. It's only like 105 pages. In the next video, we are going to summarize and analyze chapter five. Probably summarize and analyze chapter six when we finish that, too, and finish up in the next video. If you enjoyed this video, please hit like, subscribe, comment below, and hit the notification bell. And please stay tuned for the remaining of John Steinbeck's Of Mice and Men. And you have a great day.